Well, hello, Year 11. This feels like this has been a long time coming, but here we are, night before your GCSE Design and Technology exam. You'll see the heading that you'll see on the front of the paper. It is Design and Technology, and we know that product designers and textile students will be sitting exactly the same paper. Make sure you fill in the top of the paper with all your details, as I am sure you are very used to doing by now. Just a reminder that the, fine, the exam is two hours long. It is two hours long because you are supposed to be working for that full length of time. So if you find that you haven't used that time fully, you need to please go back, check, and make sure you've answered every single question and make sure that you have given an example or an explanation for every point that you make. Just a reminder that you need to make sure you've got a calculator and a protractor in the exam so that you can be successful with the maths questions. The protractor might be used for measuring angles. Equally, in the past, it's been used to draw pie charts and the calculator will be used several times during the paper. Everything else, same rules as every other exam. You're writing in black pen and you should only be using pencils for drawing. There's three sections to the exam paper spread over 100 marks. 20 marks are for section A, that's your multiple plot choice section, 30 marks for section B, which is where you talk specifically about textiles, and section C is worth 50 marks. That adds up to about 100 marks per minute, which fills up the time beautifully. Sorry, one mark per minute, which fills up the time beautifully. So having filled in all the details on the front page with your name, candidate number and signature, you should read the information on the front page just to settle yourselves into the exam. Then when you turn over onto the first inside page, you will see the beginning of section A. It reminds you that this is about core technical principles. Core technical principles means it's the core information that affects all product designers, whether they're working in plastic, metal, wood or fabric. So the set questions in this section could be about any element of the course, but we know they're multiple choice, so we know it's only going to be a very tiny amount of knowledge that you need to know about each topic. Some of the questions you'll be able to work out by a process of elimination and some of them are real life scenarios. So think about your knowledge from other subjects and what it's like just to use products in the real world. You have to answer every single question. If you're not confident, then go back and check the ones that you're less confident with at the end. There's a reminder about how to fill in and answer these questions with the diagram at the top of section A. So we're colouring in each lozenge in black pen when we think it's the right answer. It must be coloured in in black pen. If you use pencil, it might not show up when they scan the papers in at AQA. If you make a mistake or change your mind, you simply put a neat cross through the lozenge or the answer that you got wrong and then correct it with one final blob. So every single question you're going to have a go at, that is the best way of being successful. I'm going to let you flick through the next set of slides independently. I'm not going to talk over them. Each of the slides details the basic information for lots of topics that might crop up in this section. So you can flick through the ones that you're confident with and then pause for longer if there's areas that you are less confident with.
So most of the questions in section A are multiple choice, but there will be a couple of slightly longer answers towards the end. They should allow you to discuss topics that you're confident with. So and in this example from last year's paper, they're asking you to suggest one specific modern material. Product designers and textile students will answer that in different ways. So you choose one that you're confident with discussing. Um, Kevlar is always a really safe option to talk about in textiles um, and explain how the modern material improves the function of the product. So how does a material make that product work better? Well, as an example, Kevlar makes bulletproof vests work better because it's a very, very lightweight fiber, but it is as strong as steel. What you will see towards the end of section A is a question about a particular material. Last year it was about plastics and it was specifically about HDPE plastics, which we don't learn about specifically in textiles. It could well be about a fabric this year, it might be about a metal or it might be about a paper or a timber. You don't need to know the technical stuff about these materials. What you need to do is think about the product. So the question here asks, give two detailed reasons why HDPE is suitable for this type of packaging. Well, hopefully you've all seen bleach bottles at home and you've seen cleaning products at home and you would know that they need to be leak proof, that they need to have safe screw caps, that they need not to degrade through chemicals, that they need to be sturdy enough to stand up that they need to be mouldable so that they can be made in the shape to fit under your toilet lid. So it's a case of looking at this question, not panicking that you don't know about the specific material, but just thinking, well, this is real life. What would I need this material to be like? And that usually is the style of question that heads up the end of section two. I mean, section A. Section B is where you can really be confident and talk about textiles knowledge. It's called specialist technical principles. You are textile specialists. You need to answer all the questions in this section. The answers will start to become longer, which means you need to make a point and then give evidence or an explanation to back it up. Try and see each two marks as a point and then evidence or explanation.
there are frequently questions about how designers might choose to work with a particular material or a component. So think about the experiences that you know about. How did you choose which fabric to use for your final product? Is it that it needed to be stretchy or that you needed to be able to dye it or that you needed it to be strong? Those are decisions based on the properties of the materials. But you might also make decisions about what is available. So we might ideally want to work with silk, pure silk fabric because it's soft and it's got a luster. But the availability of pure silk is quite difficult to come by in our local area. We don't have very smart fabric shops, but also the cost might affect what we choose. Same way with components. We can only buy things that are available um, and that are affordable. So there's often a question about how we choose materials based on different factors. There is often a question about cutting out. And when the design technology paper phrases questions about cutting out, it doesn't often use that phrase. It often says about making wastage or cutting to a tolerance. So when we create wastage in textiles, we cut fabric. When we cut to a tolerance, we cut fabric accurately using a paper pattern. This is the example used from last year's exam paper, and you'll have seen it in the PPE, um, the cutting by shearing confused a few students, and I think it confused some of you in the PPE. Um, cutting by shearing doesn't mean about shearing a sheep, it means using fabric shears. So we'll look at revision of the names of different tools for cutting in a moment, um, but fabric scissors are often referred to as fabric shears. So this question was simply asking students to describe how to cut fabric out accurately. So you draw the paper pattern and you pin it down and you'd draw it and label it to make sure that you've got five marks. There's often a question about how materials can be improved by being reinforced. And notice how the, the phrasing is always about how materials, it's not saying how wood can be reinforced or how paper can be reinforced. You choose to talk about textile materials here. So when we make fabrics, when we reinforce fabrics, we're making them stronger. We're making them stiffer. And we do that by looking at the left hand side of this slide. We can use interfacing, we can use quilting, we can use piping to strengthen an edge. We can laminate fabrics by layering them up with different layers of plastics and things. That happens with PVC and fake leather, but also Gore-Tex. We stick weatherproof layers together. Um, we can reinforce by using metal rings, such as rivets around the edge of circles and things. So there's lots of ways of reinforcing fabrics. There's often a question about addition as well. 
So you think to yourself, well, how do I add things together in textiles? Mrs Smith wouldn't talk to me about adding addition in textiles, but we do add things together. We add two pieces of fabric together when we sew a seam. So you could explain how to sew a seam. We add two pieces of fabric together when we do a plique. We add decoration to fabrics when we print or batik or tie dye. We add decorative decorative stitches through embroidery so just try and think open-mindedly as a textile specialist how would you add things on sometimes they give us a really specific question about a particular product and sensibly you probably wouldn't choose to talk about the polymer toothbrush in this advert in this example hopefully you would choose the cotton skirt and the question in this context again from last year's paper is about deforming and reforming they're referring to the pleats so deforming and reforming is about how you would create different shapes with fabric which could be pleats but it could also be things like gathers or putting darts in it could be molding fabric like felt which is why you've got a hat maker making a mold in the top corner. So we can reform fabric by making it into different shapes. It includes things like quilting and hemming as well. You know these examples. Choose examples that you know you've done to talk about because then you can talk about them confidently. There's usually a question about surface treatments and finishes which is what we do to a fabric once it's been made into a fabric or made into a product. So it's things like adding colour through printing or dyeing. That's a surface treatment. A finish is about something we change about the surface of the fabric to make it look better, feel better or behave better, behave differently. So we can stop fabrics burning if we spray them with a flame retardant. We can spray them with nanofibers as stain protection. We can spray them with waterproofing nanofibers so that they don't absorb water anymore. We can make them crease resistant in the same way. We can add decorative pattern by adding printing or changing the surface of a fabric. We stonewash jeans, then we get different worn out patterns on the jeans. If we rub denim, then we get that worn frayed appearance. We can make fabric super shiny by rolling them through big heavy rollers. That's called calendaring. Or we can brush fabric to make it nice and soft and fluffy and comfortable by basically rolling the fabric through massive hair brushes. And the example I've given you in the past is that works really nicely on nice Christmassy cozy pajamas. The final question of section A has historically, section B, sorry, has historically been about sustainability and the six R's and how we can and why we need to make sensible choices and sustainable choices to make sure we don't damage the environment when we're making products. There are so many examples to talk about with this in the textiles line of business this can be a really successful question for you it's usually the longest question it's usually nine marks you have to work harder to get those nine marks than you might work to get nine marks in other subjects so you do need for those nine marks to fill up at least that whole side of a4 that they give you if not more there's extra space at the back of the paper and you use the um, P model to help you explain it. Point, evidence, explain. Sometimes it's a really direct question about the six R's. Sometimes it's a little bit wider about how pollution happens or or how we can make sensible choices and good to say sustainable choices as customers about the products that we buy, um, how often we buy them, where we buy them from, what they're made of and how we use them and how we throw them away. Carbon footprint often comes into it 
and hopefully you are really familiar with that from science and geography. Um, when you see a question that's about analysing and evaluating, you're making an observation for analysis and evaluating is about what's good or what's bad. In between that, you would give your evidence. So for an eight mark in this example, I would be expecting at least four point evidence and explain explanations. So you, it's not, not clear cut. It's not a simple eight points and you've got it. We need to really explain your choices. This is our life cycle analysis diagram and we've seen it lots and lots and lots and it's thinking about how pollution happens and where pollution happens in the product life cycle. So it starts right from the beginning at the raw materials extraction stage. So whether we're harvesting cotton or harvesting wool or whether we're extracting oil to be processed into polyester and nylon there is an effect on the environment. Some of those fibres have less of an impact, some of them have more, and a sustainable designer would be looking at how we can damage the environment the least. So where the materials come from affects the environment, how they're processed affects the environment, so how many chemicals are used to clean the wool, how many chemicals are used to dye the fabrics, um, in manufacturing, of course, we've got all the technology in the factories needs powering by electricity. So that causes pollution in very simple terms. And so does assembly, joining the products together. Using our textiles products really affects the environment and gives us lots to talk about. Um, there was a question a few years ago that talked very specifically about manufacture, use and disposal. Um, and if we're using a textiles product, we normally have to clean it and dry it and iron it. So that gives us lots of things to talk about. Um, and at the end of a product's life, we're looking at whether we throw it away. If we throw it away, does it go into landfill? Can it biodegrade or can it be recycled or could we pass it down to somebody else? So all of these stages of the product life cycle can affect the environment and do affect the environment. So we need to make it be making sensible choices about how we can reduce the impact. In between each stage, of course, we get transportation and that creates pollution as well. So in between every stage of processing, materials need to be transported from one place to another. In some cases, they're transported from one side of the world to another. In some cases, like a lot of trainer production, for instance, part of the shoe will be made in Japan, part of it will be made in China, part of it will be made in America, and then everything's got to be transferred to an assembly point somewhere different. So it's not even necessarily that whole products um, are made in particular countries. Sometimes it's just part of products. So transportation, whether it's through air or sea, or lorry causes a lot of pollution as we know. So when we're talking about where the materials come from, we can look at how it affects the environment in terms of what it looks like and also um, how it affects natural habitats. Material processing gives us air pollution but also can cause pollution in waterways or the sea. Um, and when we start manufacturing, that's when we start getting waste. So how do we deal with that waste? Could we gather up all the offcuts off a factory floor and use those offcuts to make new fabrics? Or do we just gather them up and throw them away? Here's our images to remind us about how we use textile products. So washing them uses a lot of power to power the washing machine. You've got the detergent and the plastics involved in that, that then pollutes the sea. And of course it uses a lot of water. Tumble drying uses a lot of electricity and therefore power and then ironing as well. So how can we minimize the effect that using our product has? Maybe we go for quick dry, product, dry products. Maybe we go for non-iron products. Maybe we care less about whether our products are creased or not. And then end of life piles and piles of clothes here that go into landfill. Think about the fibres that do biodegrade. 
So that's anything that is a natural fibre, whether it's plant or animal. But also think about the fibres that don't degrade. Think about fibres that could maybe be untwisted and then re-spun and then woven again. When we see the effects of pollution, we're quite familiar with the plight of the seas, but also rivers, particularly rivers local to where lots of textiles production happens. So we, we don't have a huge fabric production industry in the UK anymore, but other countries do. And it's not natural to see loads of pink foam floating down your rivers where you get your water and where you wash your own clothes. So pollution can happen in water. We see the effects on our coastline. If there's been an oil spill, we see the, the oil pattern on top of the water. We definitely are seeing tiny little pieces of plastic landing up on our beaches, more and more so. Carbon footprint, give examples of air pollution. Air pollution causes um, global warming, and therefore we've got rising oceans, we've got habitats being damaged, we've got insects dying out, mammals dying out, and the more a product has to travel around the world, the more carbon footprint it creates. And all of those pollutants have an effect on human beings as well. More and more so, we're eating plastic in our food because it's, it's everywhere. But um, people who have lung conditions also suffer when air pollution is bad. Then we come to section C, which is the biggie. 50 marks, it should take you about an hour. Um, and this is a section is, that is about designing and making principles. Again, you are answering all questions in this section. Think about your NEA. This is the process of how we design and make. And the order of section C often mimics the process of your NEA. So it looks at things like research, analysing that research, writing a specification, coming up with ideas, iterating those ideas into new ideas, testing how you're going to make your ideas, modelling them, and then planning the making of them, and design communication. So this is where we'll see the drawing questions. Section C usually, although not always, but usually begins with a product analysis question, which in a lot of cases just involves some common sense. This is what you saw in your PPE paper, um, and it was a nice product really, because it involved textiles and wood. My guess is it won't involve textiles or wood this year. It might go back to plastics or metals. But the point is, it's always a real life product that you would have experience of. It will show you pictures and it will give you a specification. It will give you details about what that product is made of. And it will ask you questions. What makes it work well? That's function. What is it made of? How does that affect the environment? How useful is it for um, the user? We did the tent question a long time ago. That was a brilliant question because it was a two man tent. Um, and they asked how suitable it was for a family of four. Well, it's not suitable for a family of four if it's a two-man tent, is it? And nobody needed to study textiles technology to know that. You can just use your common sense on this one. It's often an analyse, sorry, an analyse and evaluate question. When we analyse, we make an observation or a point. So this one here is analyse and evaluate the garden furniture and its packaging in terms of fun functionality. Well, we know that it's made of a cotton fabric, so that functions well. That functions well at. Sorry, that's it, an interruption. I'm going to have to reconvene. That functions well at keeping the sun off, but it doesn't function well at keeping the rain off. So that's sort of functional but not completely functional. So functional is how well it works. One of the examples you'll have seen in the past is this one about um, hoovers and how a hoover has changed over time and how innovation, good ideas have made hoovers develop over time. We saw a similar question about kettles and irons as well. 
Innovation is about the good ideas that people have to make products work easier. So a initial suction bag vacuum cleaner was heavy, didn't manoeuvre very well. Um, so people over time thought, oh, a hoover that you don't actually have to use at all yourself, a robot will do it for you, is better. Iteration is how a product changes over time. So if somebody, it was a huge leap for somebody to initially say, oh, I need a product that's going to hoover up electronically, when the first hoovers would have been developed without electricity without electricity, they'd have just been carpet cleaners. So iteration is how products change gradually over time. You used iteration in your NEA because you did initial ideas, then you did developed ideas, and then you moved on to your final idea. That's iteration. It's about working out what's good, what's bad, and what can be better. You need to look at the work of others. Um, that question didn't crop up last year, so my hint would be that it's a bit. Sometimes they ask questions about why we look at the work of other designers, and that's all about generating our own ideas. Um, and you can explain, hopefully, and give examples of why looking at a designer helps you to design new products. And there's an example of a mark scheme there and what you might say. Or it might ask you to name one designer. They won't ask you specifically about a designer because there's so many that you could have studied. So you will have a choice about the designer that you choose. So we've looked at Quant and Westwood. We also look is important. You also need to know about different design companies. So you did some really good research and recall about who was it it was under armor and primark and gap um, in the past so they may well ask you about a design company um, and they'll also ask why we need to evaluate when we develop prototypes so that's about how we judge our ideas against other things the design question is a certainty so it could be any of the design drawing styles. It's unlikely, unfortunately, to be freehand sketching, but if you talk about fashion drawing, that's a freehand sketch. It could be about isometric drawing. However, last year's question was the exploded pencil sharpener, if you remember. So I don't think it will be isometric or creating, but it could be could be perspective drawing so there's one point perspective where everything vanishes to a single point it could be two point perspective um, although that was quite recent the birdhouse project you did or drawing you did um, that was a two point perspective drawing so I, I'm not convinced that will come up the gap that there has been for a couple of years is the idea of orthographic drawing um, where they give you the top, the side, and the front views. Um, top view is sometimes called the plan view, of course. So you can do your own research into that. We've done many questions about that in the past. We know there's going to be maths questions. It's okay to draw all over these math questions. Um, sometimes the options are to calculate or just some, they do it, accept you drawing on them to work out proportions and things. So read them. They're often worth several marks, so don't just ignore them. Even if you just write down what you know, that's sometimes. Okay, year 11, that is it. The end, the end of Textiles Technology GCSE. So lots of you have set, given yourself a really good head start with the NEA. Doing as well as you can in the exam is really important because that builds up the NEA. Mark, if you didn't do as well as you wanted in the NEA, you still have opportunity to really crack the exam and get as many marks. Every single mark counts. 
I'm going to be available Monday morning with Mr. McGethy and we'll have some breakfast stuff available in one, two, five. Yes, that's my food room, isn't it? One, two, five. So we can go through some questions then. If there's topics you're not sure of, we will go through them. We'll be available from quarter past seven. If not, make sure you are lining up at half past eight. I expect you to be in uniform to some degree out of respect for the course but also to get yourselves in a good mindset and to set a good example to the rest of the school. You can probably hear the rest of the school lining up now. This is your last Friday morning. This is the last line up of you being in the school. I will see you Monday morning. Work hard and I wish you lots of luck.